ອົງຈຸນຍຸບແລະກາບັນໂຕກະຈຳນາການນິຕິວິທີສະມະນາກາພິພິດສາດັ່ງດາວສະດັບສະຄີກໍາແນ່ຈຸນຍິງ Oui, bonjour, professeur Chandler. Je vous remercie également pour votre présence aujourd'hui parmi nous. J'ai peu de questions, mais quelques questions à vous poser. Tout d'abord, vous avez parlé d'une personne dénommée Cox Ross que vous avez interviewée. Vous avez dit que cette personne n'avait jamais été interviewée précédemment. Est-ce que vous souvenez dans quelles conditions vous êtes rentré en contact avec cette personne, Cox Ross Est-ce que c'est quelqu'un qui vous l'a présenté Est-ce que c'est lui qui s'est présenté lui-même As I remember, uh, there was a very able person whose name I've forgotten and who has since died who served as a driver and uh, assistant to many journalists in Cambodia. And when this man knew that I was looking for uh, people who had been at uh, S21 and provided uh, arranged for my interview, him Hui, for example, he found that through contacts of his, he had located uh, this other person and had uh, ascertained that he would be uh, willing to uh, come and talk to me. And that's how that was arranged. Par ailleurs, concernant donc, euh, les archives, on sait qu'elles sont particulièrement volumineuses. On sait aussi qu'une euh, partie, cependant, ne nous est pas parvenue. Est-ce que le fait qu'il euh, manque une partie de ces archives est susceptible d'affecter l'évaluation des documents qui nous est parvenu ou est-ce que cela n'a d'incidence, par exemple, que sur la détermination du nombre de prisonniers détenus à S21 Ah, on ne peut pas affecter mes conclusions. Quite short, where in fact the prisoners are quite important, so I figure those confessions have been removed by someone for some reason uh, quite a while ago. Uh, there are the, the document that was put before us uh, earlier, the uh, one from March 76. I mentioned that was one of five copies, an original which obviously went to brother number one and four uh, carbons uh, that were all the record that was made of that meeting. Now, we have, I think, six or maybe seven of those documents, all from a brief period of 1976. But we know by inference that such documents must have continued to be produced through the rest of 76 77 and 78, were we in possession of those top secret decision announcing documents on the part of the party leaders, I think it's quite possible that some of our uh, 
information about uh, DK would change. I don't think we'd find it was uh, a more uh, genteel or uh, responsive uh, government, but that's certainly an archive we know uh, must have existed and has now uh, disappeared. À plusieurs reprises dans votre ouvrage, vous faites, décrivez l'univers de S21 comme un univers marqué par la déshumanisation. Est-ce que vous pourriez, en quelques phrases, nous dire ce qui caractérisait fondamentalement cette déshumanisation de l'univers de S21 well, uh, that's an excellent uh, quite philosophical question that I'll do my best to answer. Uh, the dehumanization, of course, uh, well, it affected to some extent the lives of the people working at the prison who were not able to take time off or go into the city or uh, be free, if you like. Uh, and some of them in their confessions complained about these uh, restrictions. The real dehumanization affected uh, the prisoners from the moment, well, probably from the moment they were arrested, but certainly from the moment they arrived at the prison. Only the, those of very high rank in the party were treated with anything like ordinary respect. They were uh, mistreated physically and mentally, psychologically from the moment they arrived. And I think they were considered from the moment they arrived to have departed from the human world of people who had not committed crimes. L'accusé ici présent au cours des débats a eu l'occasion de nous indiquer à plusieurs reprises qu'il n'avait pas euh, confiance dans l'authenticité des aveux recueillis à S21, qui ne les considérait pas comme reflétant la vérité. Alors, est-ce que vous êtes en mesure de nous dire si, tant de la part de l'accusé, mais aussi peut-être des euh, dirigeants du Kampuchea démocratique, il y avait, je ne sais pas ce on, comment on pourrait le qualifier, ou un aveuglement une forme de cynisme ou une forme, je ne sais pas, de paranoïa Est-ce qu'il y avait des choses de cet ordre-là dans le fonctionnement de S21 de la part de ses dirigeants Again, uh, wide-ranging question. I'll do my best to, to uh, answer it. Uh, the, I haven't found in the archive, obviously because some uh, documents are not no longer in existence, any evidence that there were people at the archive, uh, interrogators or guards or uh, administrators of the prison, who went on record as saying that the confessions were not accurate. Uh, I think uh, the defendant is accurate in saying at this point that at the time probably and certainly with hindsight or at the time he knew and with hindsight he, he declares uh, that he knew this to be the case but I had statements like that uh, gone up to the uh, leadership uh, I think his uh, position and his life might well have been in danger so therefore the 
confessions and the whole machinery of producing confessions was allowed to just run on uh, steadily in some senses regardless of the accuracy or usefulness of a good deal of the information which is uh, evident to someone uh, even like myself uh, reading the confessions. I'll give an example. Uh, in 78, uh, several uh, prisoners uh, said that they had uh, dug tunnels in Cambodia, in Phnom Penh, and inside these tunnels had hidden uh, Vietnamese soldiers. Now it seems to me that had there been any truth to such allegations, uh, people would have been sent out from the prison with uh, shovels and guns to find these, these uh, Vietnamese, but they obviously weren't there, they couldn't possibly be there. But this confession was a, these confessions were allowed to roll forward, largely, I think, to serve, uh, to satisfy the need uh, on the part of the uh, senior members of the re regime that these sorts of things were taking place. Je vous remercie beaucoup, Monsieur le Professeur. Je n'ai pas d'autres questions à poser au témoin. Monsieur ຄົນລົກປະທານອົງຈຳນວນຈຳແດ່ເປັນສົມສາຄົມລົກປະຟິເຊີ the first uh, thank you very much. Um, well, we don't actually have that any document that uh, sets forth the rationale for the establishment of S-21. Uh, I found a document in uh, DC CAM uh, saying that a crew of workers should go to the uh, grounds of Bonilla Yacht High School and uh, mow grass and put in tables and chairs, clean the place up. That's how I knew it was getting started, but there's no document from the top as I said before, these documents are missing, that established why the leadership felt that not only that S-21 should continue in existence, it had been in existence uh, almost since uh, April 75, but that it should move to, uh, to the uh, tool slang location and that it should become a totally secret institution, which apparently before that move, if it had not been totally secret, some people might even have been uh, released from the earlier, its earlier uh, incarnation. But clearly one can infer that the reason why the regime uh, established S-21 was that particularly as 
Judge Cartwright suggested in about mid-1976, after April and intensifying into September, the leadership was convinced that nests of traitors existed inside the Communist Party, that the number of guilty people would outrun the uh, capacities of the the previous location and that a uh, full-scale interrogation facility needed to be established uh, to uh, work on uh, these uh, suspicions uh, in order to produce uh, clear information to the leadership as to what conspiracies were actually taking place or more important, being planned. But Akun Sastacha Chandler, some new man top June Lok. Tata, Krauby Ban, Lok Ban Success, Rauchiu, no. I can start a trend, they look banana and the crunchy power of a lot of look ban through the net, moon and bone, ban take two day, quarter day, cry mong, crabby means a call with chill like cornell, no, ban fuka, copy, chee, microfilm, look ban, chul chill to knong, but what the bong, carbon card, stab man, some of him winning. Some no so look, tar, knong, no, look of ban. บัญชีแดดថាលោកផែជាអាចនឹងឆ្លើយនៅសំណួរដល់ច្រើននៅក្នុងកាបង្កើតមន្ទីរសមភ័យមួយនេះបានសំណួរចំពោះលោកថា
uh, prisoners, uh, if we can say that by their confessions, they were in a process of re-educating themselves, rebuilding themselves into uh, better citizens by having admitted uh, their, what they'd done, uh, they were re-educating themselves uh, in order to be killed. And that to me doesn't make any sense except returning to one of uh, Judge Cartwright's questions, that it was of key importance to the regime not to admit that this facility even existed. So therefore, uh, there's no way of releasing or forgiving or saying that prisoners had re-educated themselves or had been falsely accused. Uh, so the whole thing, uh, in a sense, uh, breaks down. Uh, and it's impossible for me, anyway, to say that they're following a precise model. I don't think this is one thing they did very often. They didn't follow a precise model. អរគុណលោកសាស្ត្រាចារ្យសំនួរបន្ទាប់ជូនលោកវាហៈ <coughs> ខ្ញុំលើកឡើងពីសៀវភៅរបស់លោក <coughs> เอ่อสมนูสมสู่จูนลูกศาสตราจารย์ uh, I don't have access to any other material than what's in the book that it was known as uh, Salma Pompei Mui Ka, K-H-S, uh, and the uh, note for that is on, it will give you the source. I don't have any information to answer that question. អរគុណលោកសាស្ត្រាចារ្យដោយពេលវេលារបស់ខ្ញុំនោះវាមានកំណត់ខ្ញុំវាមានឯកសារដែរប៉ុន្តែបើសិនជាពេលវេលារខា
appear on hundreds of confessions. They frequently correct and denigrate what prisoners confess. They suggest beatings and torture. They urge interrogators to unearth the buried truth that the prisoners are hiding. Doik also summarized dozens of confessions, pointing out the links he perceived with earlier ones and suggesting fresh lines of inquiry. Professor, is that correct that you observed and take, took note of hundreds of annotations by Doik and that formed your conclusion as to how he participated in this uh, interrogation process? Yes, it did. I mean, I had no access to uh, defend it myself, uh, but I've never had access to him. Uh, so the only evidence I could use are two, two kinds. One uh, from people who had worked at the prison uh, uh, or uh, survivors, and secondly, uh, from his written uh, comments. And the survivors uh, entirely date from 1978, when the in many cases the operations of the prison were winding down late 1978, and when Several prisoners were, I guess you could say, plucked out uh, by Doig to perform other tasks and thus forming the small core of survivors. Uh, the written annotations in uh, Red Ink, and, and I'm very uh, jealous of the neatness of his uh, calligraphy, is wonderfully readable and uh, clearly expressed. I think uh, reveal what can only be described as his professional enthusiasm for the job which he had uh, taken on uh, with some evidence that not a job that he had sought out, but a job that he had been assigned to by his superiors. Uh, and he wanted this, as I said in an earlier uh, answer, I think, he wanted S21 to be seen by his superiors and perhaps uh, not knowing, of course, the regime was going to collapse as swiftly as he did, to be seen also by the international community as a, eventually, as a highly professional uh, and efficient uh, organization uh, of which he, as its uh, administrator, could be uh, justly proud. Those annotations uh, that you noted, did they appear consistent over time from the beginning of S21, say in 1975, till the end of S21, early in 1979? Are you able to observe the consistency of those annotations? Uh, yeah, I can't answer probably could have taken a few days to answer that question if I'd been given it in advance, because I would go back to look at the confession that I was annotated on. My feeling is that they diminished in late 1978, when by his own testimony he was becoming uh, disillusioned with uh, his work, uh, disillusioned with what was happening at the prison, and that his, his loss of enthusiasm be reflected in a decline in the enthusiasm of his annotations, but I'm not able to say that definitively because I've not had a chance to go back and look at the 1978 confessions that I've got photocopied in Melbourne to see if that's true. But I would just guess that's true. I know the 76 and 77 annotations retain a steady level of professionalism and enthusiasm. Thank you. And the, the period that you predict or suggest may have de he may have declined in terms of his enthusiasm is in late 1978. Is that correct? 
Yes, it's after the uh, purchase of the Eastern Zone were winding down, and when, of course, his own uh, former, uh, one of his patrons, uh, Von Vett, uh, came under uh, scrutiny. Now, I don't, I've just seen it. I can't say this for sure, but my guess is that uh, the defendant was pretty sure when Von Vett showed up that those charges against his former patron were probably not accurate, that Von Vett had not been a, a traitor, but like, I'm only speculating there. The, the point is, at the very end of the administration of S-21, uh, the period in which we have quite ample uh, evidence from uh, survivors, uh, was a period when he was starting to, seems to me, pull back to an extent from uh, the uh, enthusiasm with which he'd administered the prison before. Thank you. And a, and a particular aspect you noted of confessions uh, I read from your book was the, the consistency of strings of traitors being attached to the confessions and uh, obviously then forwarded um, up the chain of command. If I can quote at page 81, the strings of traitors appended to nearly all of the confessions occasionally run to several hundred names, creating the impression of a vast nationwide conspiracy. This is exactly what Doik and his superiors had in mind. And then you quote uh, Steve Hedder, who states, the worldview of the confession includes the individual who is confessing, the people above him who persuaded him to betray the revolution, the people below him whom he persuaded to betray it, Everything is seen in terms of networks and forces. Very few prisoners admitted to making decisions on their own. Do you agree with that, that comment, that the confessions were very much viewed to be uh, a vehicle to connect and, and bring together other enemies or perceived enemies, and that being the main goal of the, of the confession? Well, it certainly was a major aspect. Uh, I mean, it, it sort of goes without saying that you can't conspire by yourself. Uh, you have to have co-conspirators. And so if you're, if you're a, a traitor, you must be working with other people. Uh, and given the hierarchical way that uh, supposedly egalitarian PK was operating, these networks would have been included, as uh, Heder uh, said, uh, people above the speaker and people below the speaker all linked together in a uh, string or a kasai that uh, was uh, perceptible uh, to the administration of S21 after they had read uh, the strings uh, put down uh, by the prisoner. But, of course, the problem here is that it seems to me quite likely that many of the prisoners simply wrote down a list of everybody they knew, regardless of whether these people in the list were traitors or had known anything about a conspiracy, or uh, they were producing a list of those people, they knew they were told to do this. Now, I'm not sure how thoroughly uh, these lists were then uh, uh, capitalized on and people would go out back into the, into the country to uh, countryside to find these people. Uh, but certainly what was demanded of the prisoners was that they produce such lists, uh, whether they were accurate or not, and again, back to some of the things I'd said earlier, uh, the point of these lists and producing these lists and to forward some of them uh, up the line from S21 was to confirm the suspicions, accurate or not, uh, suspicions of the party leadership that the country was severely beset by internal and external enemies.
Thank you. And, uh, just briefly, uh, did you do any cross analysis whether or not people that were mentioned in the confessions as uh, enemies were in fact brought into S21 subsequently or arrested in other places? And if you did, um, what percentage or was that in large numbers or small numbers? It's a very, very good question. Oh, should I actually? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. right. So. Um, I didn't do that kind of analysis, I'm afraid. It would have been very interesting. I think some other people have done some of this uh, analysis. Uh, certainly, uh, they were also told on occasion to list people who'd already been arrested. <laughs> that would make things easier for the bureaucracy, that they're the people who had told them to do it were people who had already been uh, smashed, if you like. Uh, they were not given a total free reign. In other words, a couple of times, uh, prisoners, one prisoner listed uh, because she had taught him in school, uh, Pol Pot's wife, Pien Ponnery, as a member of the CIA, because he felt he had to be, everybody he knew had to be in the CIA. And Doig saw this confession and put down in the margin, whose wife, in other words, removed this crazy accusation. So, but it's a, it's a very good question. I'm, I'm sorry in a way I didn't pursue that, but it would have, uh, it would have taken just much too long. Mr. President, um, we have uh, five minutes left or seven minutes left with this witness. I was wondering, bearing in mind the, the shortness of the examination by the trial chamber, whether the prosecution could have uh, an extra 15 minutes, bearing in mind I think uh, the professor may be available for the whole day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Professor, how much would you say that uh, the accused Doik fueled the, uh, the purges and the activity of arrest, even though you didn't do that cross-analysis, but in the way in the way that he worked, in the way that the confessions uh, consistently had long lists of traitors and enemies, how much would you say he was simply responding to a request from the senior leaders or, in fact, fueling the purges and the terror in Cambodia at the time. That's another excellent question, and it's one I can't answer accurately without having done the work myself. Uh, I'm also not certain uh, of how many people were available to uh, fan out from S21 to locate some of these people mentioned in the uh, confessions. I, I don't think, given the number of names in all the confessions that showed up, that they were ever able to find a majority of these people uh, and bring them in. Uh, I think it goes back to one of the other questions. I think in some cases, again, we don't know which ones, uh, the defendant and his colleagues knew that or guessed uh, that these lists were of uh, no value, really, were not worth pursuing. My guess is that the, and I'm pretty sure this is true, once you got higher up the chain to the confessions of senior party people, or more senior party people, particularly Cadbury, for instance, working in the Northwest in 77 and in the East in 78, that those chains were carefully examined and these people were sought out and, uh, and brought in. That's why there was such a thorough purge of those two, those two zones. 
And perhaps uh, this is an obvious question from what you've answered already to the trial chamber. But would it be fair to say that S21 was a very active institution in participating in locating of enemies rather than a passive one, just simply receiving prisoners and, and killing them? Oh, indeed. I mean, I think that's a very accurate description of the place. The, 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 what was really going on at S21 was, was the interrogations. Uh, that was the major business of the place. Uh, now, again, I've, I've tried with questions have dealt with this earlier. I mean, why do you have this mass of documents when everybody's going to get killed anyway and so on? But Interrogations were what was going on there, and it was what the defendant and several of his colleagues knew they were good at, and it's what the defendant and his colleagues were training other interrogators to be good at, and there's documentary evidence to suggest that the Interrogations did become more professional as these inexperienced interrogators uh, gained experience. But, yeah, I mean, in interrogation was, was what was going on, it was what was expected uh, from above, and you have in uh, the defendant an extremely conscientious and efficient uh, and dedicated uh, person who if you like, uh, delivered uh, the product that had been uh, demanded by people whom, not only whom he, uh, above him, but people whom, I gather, uh, he had a great deal of respect for. And, and perhaps if we can pick up on that point, um, earlier uh, in answer to Judge Cartwright's questions, you stated that, um, well, from your book, that uh, from your research, um, the accused was very hardworking, very efficient, and that he and others uh, running S21 wanted to demonstrate or display to, to senior leaders how efficient or how modern um, that institution could be, and also that you felt that he and others wanted to inform the senior leaders, um, the upper brothers, as you put it in your book, um, of the information as to suspicion that they think that they, they might need. So, so my question is, how much do you think the intensity of the work, the, the numbers of people, the number of, numbers of traitors, alleged traitors that were um, identified on these interrogations, was a, a demand of the senior leaders or the will and the, the want of S21 to display their efficiency and their effectiveness to plead to, to please the senior leaders. Is that clear? Well, obviously, I mean, it's uh, sound like a, a bit uh, of a, a, a evasion of your excellent question, but there's obviously a two-way street. I mean, I think uh, the, the defendant and his colleagues would have changed uh, their procedures if they were if word came down that these procedures were uh, not satisfactory. Uh, they would have I don't know in what direction they, would, they might have changed or how the upper people might have thought that what they were doing was unsatisfactory. But they kept producing materials to meet what they thought were the demands of those on above them. And another point, I think I don't want to uh, go too much into this, I just didn't mention this in the book, but it's occurring to me as we talk, and back to uh, Paul Post's dismissive remark about S21 and so on, that seems to me, and this is an idea that's just reaching me now, so it's kind of in Kuwait, that Maybe S21, in the big picture on the part of the, of the leaders, 
was not uh, as important as it is to those of us seeking uh, evidence about uh, uh, the DK uh, regime. In other words, I think if we had those cabinet meeting five copies only documents, I'd be very surprised if S21 gets mentioned very, would get mentioned very often. Instead, you'll have things like the Vietnamese uh, uh, foreign trade, uh, Chinese assistance, I'm just guessing. Uh, military Vietnam, problems along the border. Uh, these would be the issues that the top people would be talking about. Not, uh, have you seen the latest reports? But, but again, as we've said all morning, uh, it seems to me, in the interest of uh, the defendant and his colleagues, to produce as good a product as they could, to do as good a job as they could, until or unless uh, criticism came, that this isn't the way to operate. And it seems like that, I guess, and again, this is not, not something I have first had knowledge of, that that criticism didn't arrive. Are you, are you saying there that uh, S21 uh, was clearly on the, the senior leader's agenda, but it wasn't as high on the agenda in terms of other aspects of what was occurring in the country uh, at the time? Yeah, I'd say generally. I mean, certainly uh, the top leaders were very interested in the confessions of top cadres like Khoi Tuan and uh, Bon Vet and uh, some of these people who were coming through the, uh, through the net in 76 and 77. And I think these confessions, uh, I'm just guessing we don't have the paper trail, that some of these confessions were read not only by Sun Sen, who read a lot of them, but also by people higher up. But the day-to-day -day operations, the milling through of these hundreds of, of, I hate to call them insignificant because every life is significant, but I mean people who were not high on the chain of uh, DK, uh, ordinary combatants, workers in factories, uh, people's wives, uh, and so on, uh, they would not be interested in uh, this material. Uh, their interest would be piqued by the important people when they went through, who I think had probably been, uh, this is again a guess, in many cases had been fingered by the, by the top people. They said, it's time to get so-and-so. They got so-and-so. He was interrogated. That interrogation went up, and they read it with interest. Might even, we don't know, have come back with more questions to be asked to these people. So sometimes their interest was very, was, was high, and sometimes it was nil, I would say. Um, would it be fair to say that for the 14,000 or so that you estimate uh, were killed at S21, that um, Sun Sen or Nguyen Chia, who, was, who were the accused, uh, immediate uh, superiors at various times would not have uh, given instructions for the, for the killing of each and every one of those uh, individuals on a daily basis as, as information was coming through. It wouldn't have been of such major concern the majority of the population, but only a small minority because of their importance in the regime. Would that be correct? Yes, I would say so. I, mean, uh, I think uh, certainly it was known uh, at S21 from the, probably from the moment it opened that until late 1978 when some of these prisoners were given uh, tasks in the prison and then later survived, it was known that everybody who came into that facility was going to be killed. So, no matter what, uh, so therefore, Sun Sen, Nguyen Chia certainly didn't sign off on individual deaths because part of the question, I think it was, uh, came from Judge Cartwright, the dehumanization process had already set in. These people were of no importance whatsoever uh, to those upper leaders. They had uh, departed from uh, the revolution. They departed from Khmer society. They were of uh, 
they're as good as dead by the minute they came in. Thank you. I'm, I'm just going to read back a statement that you made at page 154 of your book, and it relates to, perhaps relates to a couple of ideas, but certainly coming through your book, we have this idea that um, we have two groups of people at S21, a very large group of young, uneducated uh, unmarried uh, males, and then we have a smaller group of teachers, um, educated, older, in their 30s, and in that smaller group, you put, you accuse Doi, um, you put you put um, Chan, Man Nai, as people that are perhaps less susceptible to, uh, to obedience, less um, um, Whereas you say that the, the younger group, uh, because of their age, are more likely and more supple, more malleable um, to follow orders, especially criminal orders. And, and that's a theme that runs through your book from your review of uh, sociologists and uh, psychologists. And then page 154, you start to focus in on uh, senior leaders. And if I quote you, and then perhaps I'll ask you a few questions, then finish. You state, excuses like those offered by Yang Sari, Nu and Chia, and Kyu San Pan are easy to understand, perhaps, but there are limits to the contextualizing of mass killing and terror. No context is spacious enough to contain Sun Sen, Doik, and the Upper Brothers. No explanations can let the murderers of 14,000 people off the hook. Someone or several people acting in the name of the party center decided to murder the prisoners held by Santambal, regardless of what they had done, so as to warn off potential opponents protect the secrecy of the operation and demonstrate the party's infallibility. Given the way DK was organized, a decision of this magnitude probably stemmed from Pol Pot, or at least met with his approval, even though no written proof of his approval has survived. The upper brothers who followed S21's operations and Sun Sen and Doik, who were directly responsible for them, knew what they were doing and chose to do it. Conceivably, they might have lessened the suffering of prisoners, released the hundreds of small children imprisoned with their parents, or curtailed the executions had they wished to do so. There were moments during the DK era when such choices could have been made and revolutionary justice being tempered with mercy. Indeed, many survivors of the DK era single, single out kindly or permissive. Uh, At S21, however, alternatives were never considered. Instead, Sun Sen and Doik and the people working under them inflicted enormous quantities of suffering on the prisoners coolly, systematically and without remorse. My, my questions are is it your position from the material that you have reviewed, from the interviews that you have read, that the accused had a choice whether to carry out these acts? And secondly, is it your position, as you stated in the book, that the accused could have minimized the suffering, the killing at S21 in the ways that, in the ways that you've mentioned? Would that have been acceptable, do you think, within the atmosphere that was operating in DK at the time? No, certainly, I stand by that paragraph because I can't believe that these actions can go 
unnoticed just because uh, there's some sort of context that can explain them. Uh, on the other hand, the idea that there were people had a free choice to disobey what they saw as the ruling context of uh, decay, which included the massive dehumanization of prisoners, the uh, no exit uh, policy whereby the, all the people who came in innocent or guilty or, or whatever were uh, to be killed. Once that context started to uh, move forward, Maybe they didn't have the choices. The choices were made fairly early, and I don't think they were made with great uh, difficulty. We do, again, we don't have the documents, but it seems from what I know about DK, it's most unlikely that if these decisions were made at the top, that dissent would have come from the middle ranks. Uh, they began to roll on once the decisions had been made, but I still feel that this is at great distance, of course. I, 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 in a way, I'm, so, I'm reluctant to say this because I've never been in any kind of a situation where I would have been in danger by refusing to do something. But I can't help but think that the people were inflicting this terrible damage on everybody uh, knew what they were doing and almost worse uh, did not seem to uh, suffer themselves from what was happening. It didn't seem to, as I said in, elsewhere in the book, it didn't seem to lead them to uh, lose sleep. It didn't seem to make their handwriting more unsteady. It didn't seem to lessen their enthusiasm for coming back to work the next day. It's in this whole context that I can't uh, help but say that the paragraph that I wrote there, which I, the last chapter took uh, several months to write, uh, but I won't stand by it, although it's a complex issue and your question was well put. Thank you. And two last questions, Mr. President. Over the, the hundreds of annotations that you reviewed from the accused, over all the reports and summaries that you've read from him in the archive, have you seen one document that shows the accused objection to carrying out these acts, or one document or annotation that would show that he was greatly displeased or hated carrying out those acts. On writing, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I wrote it. It'd be suicidal uh, for him to put in writing any uh, loud objection uh, to the way the place was running. Uh, uh, you do find some places where uh, uh, he suggests uh, that, uh, that maybe less torture might be might be used. That maybe more politics should be uh, or doing politics should be employed. Uh, uh, the uh, and in some of his. Uh, of the statements that I read from the, uh, from the tribunal and elsewhere, he was uh, quite happy about some of the confessions that could be extracted without torture. That, I mean, ideally, if they could all be done without torture, he would have, he, he claims that he would have been uh, a happier administrator of the prisoner, of the prison. But I just don't, I can't see from the documentary evidence how that very deep uh, remorse uh, followed his, came from his knowledge of the day-to-day -day activities of the prison or the, what we would call excesses that shine through a lot of the confessions and certainly through the testimonials of uh, survivors. Thank you, Professor. And my last question it relates to people escaping the terror of uh, democratic Cambodia. In your book, in a number of places, you refer to a prisoner escaping from S21, page 16, 
you refer to 80 people escaping from Presa at page 31 and 27 were not recaptured. That was a report from Hugh Sray on the 27th of November 1977. Okay. You refer at page 62, in 1977, in Chigreng, near Siem Reap, the northern zone, an uprising occurred and Cambodians escaped to Thailand. In page 48, you state from before 1977 through to 1978, uh, thousands uh, fled to Vietnam, uh, as it certainly occurred to a number of CPK cadres after 1977 or even earlier, that some form of foreign patronage, referring to Vietnamese, or even a more Vietnamese style of revolution, would be preferable to the ongoing depredations, endemic poverty, and apparently random, open-ended violence of democratic camp so, Professor, the question is, from your extensive reading, can you give a figure of the numbers of people that either escaped outside of Democratic Kampuchea to Thailand, to Cambodia, and, and how were they able to do it? Just briefly. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, my, my research didn't lead me in that direction. I know for the refugees coming into Thailand from, uh, from Cambodia before the collapse of the regime were not welcomed by the Thai, were treated poorly, uh, and were in quite small numbers because the DK cadres, as several survivors' accounts have uh, shown, particularly the uh, Pinya Thai account, uh, uh, were very assiduous in keeping people from leaving the country. Now, I think the border with Vietnam was uh, more porous. Uh, people uh, were able, I think, to move into Vietnam after 76, 77, uh, after 77, and had heard that, in fact, as Vietnamese policy was gradually changing, that they would not only be allowed, be allowed to go into Vietnam, wouldn't be thrown back into Cambodia, uh, but that they'd be welcomed. So the exact numbers, oh, I would say for the end of the regime, the exact numbers going into Vietnam would be in the low thousands, I would just uh, guess and into Thailand into the high hundreds. Uh, thank you, Professor, and thank you, Mr. President, for the extra time. ដើម្បីពិសាថ្ងៃត្រង់ហើយសម្ដាកានឹងលើកទៅបន្តនៅរសៀលនេះចាប់ពីម៉ោងមួយកន្លះសិងមានព្យុនដល់ជាតិជន